Welcome to USA Global TV and Radio, where our mission is to provide education, entertainment, hope, and inspiration. USA Global TV and Radio connects you with experts and audiences all around the world every single day to help you succeed in business and to live a richer life. Visit us at usaglobaltv.com to learn about career and life-changing training and mentoring programs like The Listening Mentor. Subscribe to our newsletter to stay informed about our special programs and offers. Discover how you can become a guest on one of our shows or a host or producer of a USA Global TV and radio show of your very own. That's USA Global TV and radio, where the doctor is always in. Well, good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, depending on where you are in the world. Welcome to USA Global TV and Radio, and this is um, you as a whole, your body, mind, and soul. And I'm Justin Rigliani. It's good to be with you this week. Hope you're uh, tuning in wherever you are, and uh, if not, you can check us on the replay on uh, YouTube. We'll be uh, uh, replaying. Uh, we've, we've talked a lot in the first couple of shows about the body last week, especially we got into weightlifting. We got into, uh, nutrition a little bit. We got into things like that. Uh, we've talked about the mind. We've talked about, uh, forgiveness. We've talked about things like that. And I hope that people call in and, or not call in, but type in and, and get involved in this show, because this is one that really means a lot to me. Um, I, I, I would not call myself a religious person. I would call myself a spiritual person. And, <clears throat> There are going to be some people who won't even watch this show because of the topic and they're going to roll their eyes and say, you know, this is just, you know, hocus pocus stuff and it's, it's crazy. And there are other people who are going to not be sure and kind of be on the fence. And I hope they join us to, to see what, the, what's, what we're going to talk about. And then there are going to be people who truly believe like I do that there are miracles there. There are signs from God and there are signs from departed loved ones and uh, I'll just give you a few of mine that I've gone through in my life. Uh, so death has always been a bugaboo for me. So when I was a little kid, uh, I was always scared of death. I was It was something um, that was just eerie about it. I was uh, afraid that I would lose family members. I was afraid that I would die myself. I was afraid of people who died coming back uh, as spirits. Um, it was a really... Uh, very death for me was very traumatic when it would happen, even if it was not somebody I knew, but if it was somebody popular or, or somebody famous or something like that, it would really shake me up as a kid. And I know being sensitive, I've, I've been very open about my battle with uh, in, uh, mental illness, with uh, depression, anxiety, and OCD. And I'm sure that has something to do with that sensitivity, but I really was fairly lucky growing up. The The first death that I, uh, of anybody who I really idolized or, or really f felt a connection with 
was a Flyers goaltender back in the 80s. His name was Pelly Lindbergh, and uh, this is 1985. I had just become a Flyers fan, really. I was 10 years old, and he was in an accident um, in 1985, and he died. And that was the first time I remember feeling uh, a loss from death, even though I didn't know him personally. Um, over the years, I've gotten to know a lot of his teammates, a lot of his friends, and and uh, through them, I feel like I've gotten to know him a little bit and, or as much as possible. Uh, you know, being now almost 49 years old, he never even made it that far. He died at 26. But uh, I remember that that was one of the ones that, that was the first one. I remember it was the first time I ever heard the term brain dead. I never heard that before. And when you have, uh, when you're 10 years old and, and you hear those things, it's, it kind of freaks you out a little bit. But uh, again, that wasn't in my family, and and it, I was able to recover from that fairly quickly. Although, you know, I still think about it from time to time, and I've written a screenplay about Pelly, and I've uh, I'm working on a documentary about the Flyers from that time, and he's a big part of that as well. So um, certainly, it's a part of my life still, even to this day. And it was 1985, but um, the first death that I really can recall in my family. Uh, was my mother's uncle, my Uncle Frank, um, and he passed away uh, 33 years ago. This past Saturday it was the, uh, October 26th. I just remember. I remember dates like that. They really stick in my head. And um, we didn't find out until the next day that he had passed away. Um, they, my grandparents, his brother, um, my grandfather, drove up to uh, Staten Island where he lived or I think it was in Tom's River at the time, one of the places. And um, they, they left us a message to, to call. And <clears throat> unfortunately, uh, our Uncle Frank had been sick and he had been sick for a long time. He, it, well, not a tremendously long time. He got sick in around 1990, at the end of 1990, with uh, a, a rare cancer and then died October 26th of 91. So he, he was sick for less than a year before he died. And... Um, I, at 16 years old at the time, really wanted to be a man like every 16-year-old kid does. I think that that's normal. I think that 16-year-olds want to show that they don't have emotions, don't have don't have feelings that are that are sad, that they could take whatever is thrown at them. And I was like every other 16-year-old. I just got into weightlifting, and you know, I, I was I was proud of being you know tough and strong and. So I didn't let anybody see me cry. I, I you know, I, if I had to cry, I would go downstairs in the basement or I'd go to my room and I would just cry there. And, and that was it. And all week I remember being, um, well, I, I remember, uh, the, the funeral. Um, I remember going to the funeral and, um, that was the first time I ever saw somebody in a casket. And, uh, yeah, that was a little strange, but I remember, you know, saying goodbye. And, um, the, the, uh, week after that, uh, at, at, well, I should say that that was probably a, a Tuesday or a Wednesday. Uh, we went back to school for Wednesday or Thursday, Friday, whatever it was. And I remember being depressed and really feeling the loss and, you know, just thinking about good times. I remember the, the last interaction that we had together, it was kind of strange. It was, he um and it, it was uh, New Year's Day, uh, and my grandmother and grandfather used to have everybody over from the extended family on New Year's Day. And Uncle Frank said, "Does anybody want apple pie? I want to go get a piece of apple pie." And I said, "Yeah, I'll take a piece." So I went over and I, I sat with him and uh, had no idea it was the last time that I ever talked to him. I, I didn't know that he was sick. I, I had no idea. And um, yeah, we just talked and and, and um, I don't remember what the conversation was about, but. And uh, when we left, I remember he was smoking a cigarette and uh, waving goodbye to us as we were pulling out of the driveway, heading back home. And that was literally the last time I saw him. Um, so after the funeral, that that next couple of days were really tough. And I remember that Saturday, uh, I said to myself, being a spiritual person, that I was going to watch the clock and it, it bothers me now. I don't remember the exact time that he passed away, but I did then I knew the time it might've been like nine 32 or something like that, whatever it was. And I'm just throwing out a number, but 
when I, at the time I knew the exact time that he died. So it was a week later. It was, it was, he died on a Saturday. It was another, the next Saturday. Um, and, and throughout the whole week, when he passed away, I said, God and uncle Frankie, you give me some sign that you're okay. Can you let me know that, you know, some way, somehow I said, could you flicker the lights? I don't know why I thought of that. I don't know why that was what came to mind, but I said, could you flicker the lights? Nothing happened. Thursday, nothing. When uh, Friday, nothing. Saturday, all day, nothing. Nothing happened. It's like, well, you know, maybe that's asking for too much. Maybe, maybe it's not real. You know, maybe it's just not, not, I don't know if what I believe is true or not. I have no idea. Uh, and then I'm looking at the clock. Like I said, I remember the exact time. And let's say it was 935. At 934, I was staring at the clock. And I saw the clock at 934. And then there were about 30 seconds left. I counted up about 30 seconds. I was like, it's about to turn into 935. I'm going to say a prayer for Uncle Frank right now. And at the exact time that he passed last week. And all of a sudden, we lost power in the entire neighborhood. And my first instinct was anger. I was like, I'm never going to know now. I'm going to miss it. I'm going to miss that uh, moment because the lights had to go out. You know, why the hell did the lights have to go out right at that moment? And then a couple seconds later, it dawned on me, wait a minute. This is what I asked for. You know, this is what I said. Could you flicker the lights? And within a few minutes, the power came back and, and the power was on again. And uh, it was the whole neighborhood, actually. And um, to this day, I don't know what happened. I don't know what caused the power outage. I, I don't know um, what the, the situation was that made that happen. But somehow that happened at that time. And I thought, man, I mean, that's. Hey, look, could you look at that and say it's just coincidence? Like, I guess you could. Um I can't look at it that as coincidence. What are the odds to, to, at that exact moment, at the exact point in time? It just would be too one in a billion ish to be a coincidence to, in, in my mind. So that was one of, that was really the first one that I ever experienced. And, uh, you know, we've been pretty lucky in our family that even the older people that we've had have have lived uh, long lives. Even the ones that have now passed, they've they've lived into at least their late seventies, if not into their nineties. Um, Uncle Frank was the youngest to go. He, he died at seventy one, um, but my grandmother died and um, in, in two thousand two, and uh, this is uh, about eleven years later, and now. Um, 27 years old. So I'm not a kid anymore. I'm not 16. You know, now I'm pushing 30. And um, my grandmother passed away. And and when we, even, she had dementia and uh, really bad Alzheimer's. And she was always talking about going home. She was always saying, I want to go home. And everybody would say, mom, you are home. You are home. And she kept saying, I, but I want to go home. I want to go home. I want to go home. And she, you couldn't convince her that she was home and then i think it was a, a thursday maybe we moved her to an actual retirement facility uh, a nursing home because we just couldn't take care of her anymore it was impossible it just it just she, we couldn't give her the care that she needed and um just a couple days later two days later that saturday uh I was away. I was I was in Baltimore. I wasn't around, but the rest of the family was was here. Um, and they got the call that my grandmother passed away. And it was just two days after we had uh, been together and, and seen her. And I, I'll never forget the last thing that happened between she and I is uh, when I was saying goodbye to her, I, I had no idea she was going to die in two days. I mean, I thought, you know, she could live another 10 years like this. There was no reason to believe that she was dying, you know, she'd had Alzheimer's, but it, it, it wasn't to the point where we thought she was actually going to die. And as I'm leaving the room, I remember she looked up at me and she seemed to have a lucid moment and she winked at me and I smiled and I waved and blew her a kiss and walked back to the, the uh, out to the car. So, you know, I think that itself was a sign. Um, that I didn't know was a sign at the time. 
And then to add on to that, when she did pass away, she was alone. Unfortunately, no, none of the family was there at the time. Uh, they were coming to visit later. It was earlier in the morning uh, or actually early in the afternoon. And they were coming later in the afternoon. And uh, she went into cardiac arrest. And as she was starting to die, she said, home. That was Those were her last words. So looking back on it now, I think, and we all think in, in the family that the reason why she was saying home was because she wanted to go home to heaven where where heaven was that was home so i think that was you know the significance of that and then after her funeral uh we got back from the funeral and on the um lawn was grass that had grown into the pattern of a heart and it hadn't been there in the morning again people could say coincidence people could say you're making this up people could say whatever they want but it, it it happened. We took pictures of it. Nobody could believe it. I mean, it, it really it, it and I, I think that's that's part of the 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 issue with these things is that they're they're hard to believe. But if you really stop and think about it, why why are they hard to believe? Why are they hard to believe? If you believe that God is there and there is a heaven, and you believe that the people who die move on and just are in another place, then this shouldn't be shocking at all. These are things that should make you feel comfort and should make you feel good that, you know, hey, they're they're there. Um, so that was another one where I, I felt a, a good feeling. Um, you know, the, the, I, I'm not trying to say it's not going to hurt. I mean, it. whenever you lose somebody, it's that, especially somebody very close to you, it's going to hurt no matter what, even if you get signs. I'm not saying that the signs take away the pain that you still don't feel it but they should comfort you in some ways um turning to uh my uh grandfather my maternal grandfather um he uh was fine up until his 90s and then all of a sudden just out of nowhere seemed to have a brain tumor uh, just came out of nowhere it was brain cancer and um you know, it was, it was not long. It, he got sick and it was pretty fast. It was, it was a, a, a rapidly growing cancer. And at 93, he didn't want to be treated anyway. He said, it doesn't matter. We're not going to treat this. And um, he, he let, he just let himself pretty much finish it out and, and just, just go, you know, take pain medication and things like that, but not, not try to fight the cancer, which made, made sense. I mean, at 93 years old, it's, too much of a battle. Surgery was just not an option at that age. And, um, and again, I, I, I went to, uh, he was in Texas with my aunt and uncle. They had been taking care of him for, uh, months, years actually. And, uh, we went to the, the, the funeral and, uh, or not the funeral, I'm sorry. The, uh, the, the, the private viewing that we had, we had a, we had a funeral back here months later, but we went to a private viewing, but it was, it was sad. I mean, to be over in Texas, he was living in El Paso and I, I didn't see him that much. Um, I remember the last conversation I had with him was, was on Halloween. Um, it was the world series was on, I was watching the game. And um, we're talking to each other on the phone like we did maybe every two weeks or so. And uh, this is months before he died. And I remember he, he was all over the place. I, would, we would talk, I was talking about the game and sometimes he was talking about the game and then he was going off on different tangents. And he was saying, I'm confused. And he, he handed the phone over to my aunt. And as I listened to him get all discombobulated and all shaken up, I whispered to myself, it's over. I just instinctively in my heart knew that there was something radically wrong and that it was over and um, turned out to be right, but months later. But we went to the uh, viewing and um, I kept asking him for, I was there for a week in Texas and I kept asking, can you throw me a miracle? Can you throw me a sign? Can you give me anything? Yeah, just anything. I said, I, I don't care what it is. You know, uh, he had been a war hero. He's uh, in, a, in a famous picture at the Elbe River, shaking hands with the Russians during World War II. Uh, so he's he, he, he was a tough, tough New York 
street kid. He he was really you know, he he could he could take a lot. He he was a, he was a real strong guy. I always looked up to him and always thought you know if I could be half the you know the the guy he is you know that that's that's pretty darn good. Um, but there was there was no miracle all week. There was there was no sign. There was no anything. <clears throat> so I just chalked it up to well, you know, you can't get it every time you want it, and forgot about it. And we packed up our bags. We got in the car, and my uncle's driving us to the airport. He starts to back out of the driveway, and all of a sudden, the car locks the on the car doors. The locks were going up and down at a rapid pace. It was like boom, 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 up and down, up and down, up and down, really hard, loud, and over and over and over again. And my uncle didn't know what to do. He's like, what is going on with this car? You know, what, what's going on? And it's literally as we're backing out of the driveway to go and leave to go to the airport. And, you know, it, it, your first instinct is there's something wrong with the car. You know, the, the, the car's got something wrong with it. And then we all looked at each other like, and my uncle's not very spiritual. I, I'm not sure if he's an atheist or agnostic, but he's he's not super into spirituality but even he was taken aback by that and he wondered he said you know is it that you know is it a, is it a sign and we all we all thought it was um and again the odds of that i mean what are the odds that we'd be backing out of the driveway it was it was my grandfather's way of saying goodbye he, he just waited till the very end to do it and i think that made it even more special by not giving it to me when i asked for it but saying, no, I'll wait till you're about to go. And then when you think you're not going to get it, then you're going to get it. You know, it's like a little surprise. It's like Christmas when there's an extra toy there that you didn't think you were going to get. And all of a sudden you find it. So I think that was his way of just saying goodbye and, and uh, a, a, as we were leaving. So, you know, I believe that to, to be a sign uh, from him and from um, my grandmother. And my other grandmother, uh, she passed away in 2009. She had been uh, sick. We and, and again, it's 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 so strange in my life how these things happen. It, it's uh, I, I don't I don't know how these things happen, but the night before uh, she had a stroke, she had a major stroke. The night before she had the stroke was a Friday night. She had the stroke somewhere on Friday night, or or uh, prop. No, I'm sorry, she probably had the stroke on Saturday. So Friday night, it was uh, around her birthday and uh, our daughter had just been born. Well, she was one and a half or two, um, little little baby. And we took Alex, our daughter over to see her and we took my grandmother out to get pizza. And, um, you know, what, what are you gonna get a lady who is 87 years old that's of any value that she could do anything with, right? So just spend time with her. So we took her to, a pizza place, a really good pizza place in Philadelphia. And we got French fries and she loved the French fries. And we got pizza and we um, drove to get water ice and she loved lemon. Uh, I remember that was her favorite flavor. <clears throat> and then we drove back to her house so she could play with the baby on the floor. You know, she couldn't get on the floor, but she could let the baby play on the floor and reach down and play with the little toys and stuff. And I remember she was spilling her water ice. I said, Dan, you're spilling your water ice. And she said, yeah, I said, it's, all, it's getting all, all uh, melted. She goes, well, that's the best part. And we had a really, really good time. And it was um, it was neat to be able to to be with her driving home um, with her to her house from the pizza place. She saw a couple, an older couple. Um, walking down uh, a main street in Philadelphia, Broad Street, and uh, they were holding hands walking. They must have been in, in their 80s, maybe even older. I mean, they were really, really old. And she turned to me and said, I wonder if that would have been us. And us is my grandfather who died at 37 years old. She lost her husband. His name was uh, Vincenzo, but we everybody called him. I, I never met him, but they called him Chenzi. And uh, Chenzi died uh, at 37 years old. She lost them. And uh, when she saw this couple, she turned to me and said, I wonder if that would have been us. And I, I don't know. I don't know why she said it. I don't know why at that particular time. But uh, we had a good day. Uh, we had a good day and a good night. 
and then we went home and then uh, Sunday we got a call that she wasn't answering the phone and we couldn't get in touch with her and nobody had seen her. So my father and I went to her house and he had a key and he walked in and I yelled upstairs, you know, Nan, are you there? And she said, yeah, I'm here. I was like, oh, thank God. You know, she, I thought something terrible had happened. She was still conscious, but she had had a stroke. And uh, when we got there, she was face down and she had been laying there probably for hours, but probably in the teens, you know, 15 hours, something like that. And um, she never really regained any, she had, she had some faculties left afterwards, but she never walked again. She had slurred speech. She can only lay down. She couldn't really sit up. Um, she really, I mean, she could eat and she could, she could hold a little bit of a conversation, but not much, but that was only for a few more months. And then, you know, she deteriorated and, uh, finally, uh, I was at home and my father called me and said, you know, she's about to slip away. Can you come over um, to my aunt's house to, to, you know, be with her? Cause we were spending a lot of time waiting for her to die. And uh, uh, I got there and he met me outside my father and he said, uh, you know, she passed. He didn't want me to call, come in the house and find out that way. So we walked to the house and, we, we held her and talked to her and, 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 you know, just had a conversation with her, even though she was physically not there anymore. Her body was there, but it wasn't alive. And um, we just talked and just cried and, you know, did the things that everybody does, I think, or that most people do in, in that situation. And then when she was taken away, it was raining and uh, we looked up and there was a double rainbow outside over the house um, when they took her away. So we snapped a few pictures of the, of the double rainbow. Um, do rainbows happen naturally in, in life, in weather? Yes, they do. Why at that moment? Why over that house? Why at that time? I mean, you could say coincidence again, but again, is it? Or is it some kind of a sign that, you know, and, and maybe maybe the sign is just that you saw it not necessarily that God put it there or that my grandmother put it there, but the fact that we were able to see it, the fact that we noticed it, maybe that's what the sign is that we notice these things and it makes us think about them. And that, that might be in itself the sign. I don't know. I mean, it's hard to, you know, I don't think anybody's an expert on these things as much as some people try to make themselves out to be experts on these things. I don't think there is one. I think you, you, you try to figure out what you can figure out um, based on, on, your experience and based on what you believe. Um, so those are those are the closest ones. Um, 1997 was was a really tough time for me. Um, I had been very very uh, sheltered in high school. I really didn't. Uh, we we moved right before high school. I moved from Philadelphia to Delaware County. In 1989, and two days later, I was starting high school, and it was hard. It was difficult for me to 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 fit in right away, and it took really a couple of years for me to fit in. I didn't go to any proms. I didn't. Uh, I went to one dance, I think, the entire time I was there in my senior year. I, I really, I was, I was really a late bloomer. Didn't date anyone. I mean, just kind of kept to myself. Played a lot of hockey. Um, lifted weights like crazy. I was, I was one of those kids. I wasn't at the mall. I wasn't at the movie theater. I wasn't at the pizza place. I was, you know, just kind of inside and, and by myself. And um, I remember college came and I was starting down that path in 1993. I started that, to have that, that same path. And um, I, I one day said to myself, there's, there's no way this is going to happen twice. I said, I already blew high school. I'm not blowing college. So in college, I, I really came out of my shell and I, I tried to be as, as friendly and as popular and as, as, as um, uh, outgoing as I, I possibly could. And uh, it couldn't have gone any better. I mean, for the first time in my life, I had tons and tons of friends, parties at my house with 50, 60 kids. I mean, you couldn't even do it today. You know, in today's climate, uh, you know, be 
cops would be there in a second, but we had a band and we had, uh, you know, 50, 60 kids out there and, and, uh, you know, doing a little drinking and, and, you know, that fun stuff, but, uh, it's like 30 years ago now. So we don't have to worry about statute of limitations has run out on that. But, uh, you know, I, I was like, I had to pinch myself and say, you know, is this really me? You know, I, I went from this kid that didn't have any girlfriends and didn't have any friends and didn't go to dances to all of a sudden going to all the dances and, and having my own parties and having girlfriends and girls that were interested in me. And that, that was a big deal. That was, that's life changing. I mean, to, to, you know, to be voted and I'm not saying this to brag or to, to, but you go from somebody who would probably be looked at as an outsider or as, as somebody who's not popular or somebody who's not, you know, one of the in crowd in high school. And then all of a sudden, you know, in, in senior year to get voted most popular, most friendly and best body, because I had been lifting in for all that time. I mean, that that's a huge switch. I mean, that's like another person. And it was, it, I, I chose to do that. I, I, I and I don't, I'm not saying it to, to toot my own horn. I just said to myself, I blew it in high school and I knew I blew it. So I said, I can't allow it to happen in college. I just can't do it. So obviously, as we started to end college, as senior year started to roll around, the panic started to, to, to set in that, you know, here I am, this big fish in a small pond. And now I'm, and off into the into the world and um you know things started to happen i, I we we uh i, I lost a, a a housemate uh in a car accident uh one of my teachers one of my favorite teachers got cancer uh my girlfriend at the time we had gotten together the year before and we were in a fairly serious relationship um obviously as serious as it can be at that age at 22 and she was i guess 19 um, turning 20 and, um, we, we broke up and, uh, so I lost that relationship. Um, uh, one of my professors, uh, father had passed away. Um, there were a bunch of things that had happened that, that just were repeated blows that were very, very difficult to, to swallow. Um, so in any event, uh, I had a really close friend at the bank that I worked at. It was Core States Bank at the time. It doesn't even exist anymore. And I had a friend, and her name was Betty, and she was in her 60s. I was 22. And every time I would come to the bank, she'd say, is that my Justin? And she'd come run into the door, and she was Italian. I was Italian. She liked the fact that I was Italian. And she would give me a big hug and a kiss every time I would come in, and, and then a big hug and a kiss every time I left. And you know, she was really, we talk a lot and joke around a lot about Italian stuff and, you know, what Italian families do and things like that. And it was really great. I mean, she was like having another grandmother. It was, it was fun. And, um, the, the week that I broke up with my girlfriend and we, it was mutual. We, we, we broke up, uh, decided that it wasn't working out. And, um, uh, it, it was hard. I, I, I was really struggling with it and depressed and, and you could see it. I mean, it, when I was working at the bank, I was really down. And I remember Betty at the end of the work shift, it was a Saturday and Betty pulled me aside and Betty said to me, Justin, come here a minute. She goes, what are you doing? She goes, I can see you, that you're depressed. I know what's going on. And I'm sure it's because you broke up with your girlfriend. And I, she, I said, yeah, Betty, that, that, that's the reason why. And she said, listen, she goes, at, at your age, she just might not have been the girl for you. So don't be sad. And she used the word blue, which most people don't use that term anymore. It's an older term, right? Like somebody's sad and blue, but she said, don't be sad and don't be blue. She just might not have been the girl for you. And it almost right. It did right. You know, it's kind of, I said, yeah, I said, I don't know. I said, thanks. I said, I, you know, I appreciate you, uh, you know, checking in on me and, I had uh, friends who had bought tickets to a Flyers game that day in Washington. For, I had never gone to a Flyers game away. And I I, told, I turned him down. I said, nah, I said, I'm not going to go. I'm just going to stay home and wallow. And uh, my father, you know, got on me and he said, no, you're going to the game. He said, get dressed, get go to the game. He said, you're crazy. He said, you got you to gotta do it. And I told him what Betty said. I said, Dad, I said, you know, this is what Betty said to me. He said, she said, you know, don't be sad. Don't be blue. She just might not be the girl for you. And 
I, and my father said, you know, Justin, that's a really good friend. That's somebody who will tell you the truth when it might not be something that you want to hear. I said, dad, you're right. I said, um, when I get to the bank, the next time I see Betty, I'm going to give her a big hug and I'm going to thank her. And, um, you know, that was it. So I went to the game. I remember I was, I was miserable. The trip to Washington was, was, I tried to have fun, but I couldn't. And I tried to enjoy the game as best I could. It was the night before Easter. I remember. And, um, later on the next week, there was a message on my parents answering machine and they were calling for me. It was the bank. And they said, can Justin call us back? And I was at a co-op that I absolutely hated. I wanted to be at school. I wanted to be with my friends. I didn't want to be at this co-op. I hated it. And it was just, it was a, it was just not a fun experience at all. So I dialed the bank's number sitting at my desk and I'm already annoyed. I'm just, you know, I'm depressed about losing my girlfriend. I'm depressed about graduating you know, there, there are other deaths that have happened over the last couple months. You know, my teacher got cancer. I mean, all these things that are bringing me down. And I just, first time in my life that I ever really considered suicide. That was, that was it. That was the first time I really thought to myself, you know what? It, it may not be worth it. Stupid thing to think, but that was the first time. So in any event, I called the number for the bank and honestly thought that they were going to say to me, Justin, do you want to work another shift or can you work another day or whatever? And I was, that's what I was prepared for. So a lady picks, picks up the phone and, and it was somebody I knew. I think her name was Christine. And they said, Hey, Christine, how are you? And she said, good, Justin, how are you? I said, all right. And uh, she said, Justin, I got to tell you something. I said, okay. I said, what's going on? She said, Justin, Betty was in a car accident last Saturday. I said, oh my God, is she all right? And she goes, Justin, Betty died. And I remember my knees buckled and I fell to the chair and I, I uh, couldn't move. I was, I was literally paralyzed. I was, I, 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 I said, uh, you know, just got off the phone and it must've been, I don't know, 15 minutes before I could actually get my legs to work to get off the chair. And I had to uh, use a restroom. And I remember standing there at the restroom, you know, not to be graphic, but for a half an hour, just standing there because I couldn't go. I, I my, my body was con completely seized. I mean, that's how, that's how devastated I was. It was just, I couldn't even do any, I couldn't bodily functions weren't working. I mean, nothing was working. Um, and, uh, it was just brutal. I mean, it was just and, and to this day, I, I, it, I just can't believe that that happened. <clears throat> so this was in April, April, um, 12th, 1997. And um, in June, June uh, of 97, it was June 29th, and it would have been the one year anniversary for me and my girlfriend getting together. And we weren't. And I was heartbroken. And it was the night of the, the Mike Tyson fight. I remember Mike Tyson fighting Evander Holyfield. And when he bit Evander Holyfield's ear, it was that fight that night. And I remember laying in bed and crying and, and, you know, watching the fight and, you know, as the fight's going on, I'm punching things myself and angry and, you know, every emotion you could think of. And finally I, I, I just was worn out and I went to bed and I fell asleep that night, one year anniversary after what happened with Betty, I fell asleep and in my dream, I see Betty. And I said, Betty, what are you doing here? You died. Like, how are you here? And she said, I'm always here. And I said, but Betty, I, I never got a chance to give you a hug and a kiss for, you know, and, and thank you so much for, you know, you trying to pull me through a, a tough day like that a couple of weeks ago. I said, I missed my chance. And she said, no, you didn't. She said, you just did it right now. And it was like, wow, you know, like this, I woke up with chills because it was like, how, I mean, yeah, you could look at that and you could say, it's just the brain and that's how the brain works. And our brain, you know, makes us think things that we want to think and, and that's it. But I can't believe that. I don't, I, I don't, I really believe that Betty came in the dream and said, I, you didn't miss your chance. You got to thank me. You're thanking me right now. And it's okay. And you're going to be okay. 
And she said in the dream at the end, after she said, before she walked away, she said, and we were in the bank actually in the dream. And she said, remember what I told you, don't be sad and don't be blue. She just might not have been the girl for you. And then she left and I woke up and uh, yeah, I, I, I've told her family that um, I looked them up years later, about two decades later, 20 years later. And I had to tell them because I just, I, I remember it all the time. And I re every, every anniversary of her death, I remember her and I remember what she, what she said. So, you know, my dad saying, Hey, you didn't, you, you really got a good friend there. And me saying, yeah, you know, I think I, I got to thank her the next time I see her. And then she dies I, within two weeks. I mean, how did that happen? I, I, it's just mind blowing that I, in, in that short amount of time, I'd lost my chance. And then I got my chance back because they're there. They're not one. See, I don't believe heaven is above space. I don't believe that it's somewhere up in the air. That we always talk about heaven up. Everything's up. I don't think it is. I think it's around. I think it's just a veil that we just can't see through. And that's what my parents have taught me too. And I agree with them. Um, you know, as an adult, I mean, when you're taught things as a kid, you have to decide whether, and when you become an adult, whether you're going to believe it or not. I mean, there are things that my parents have taught me that I don't agree with. And there are many, 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 many more things that they've taught me that I do agree with. They shape my life tremendously. But that's one of the biggies is the fact that it, it's just a veil. That They're not gone. They're not completely disappeared. They're just behind this little curtain that we can't see. But they can see us and they can feel us and they can talk to us and they can, they can do things to let their appearance be known. And I think if you're going through the loss of a loved one, and even now, I mean, if I think of a loved one enough, I could be sad. But I look back on those on those signs and I think, you know, that this is incredible. You know, this is something that's incredible. And, and it's not just signs from deceased loved ones. It's also different signs. Um, I, I am not a believer in if you pray hard enough, it'll come true. I, I, I don't believe God is a wizard or a genie or or a, a magic man who just jumps in and changes things because if he did that then we'd all be robots that's all we would be if he moved us around like chess pieces and everything we did wasn't our choice then what would be the purpose of life there wouldn't be so when i got sick when i got colitis and i had to have my colon removed i didn't pray, please take this away from me. I just said, God, please help me get through this. And we went up to see the surgeon in Inglewood Hospital. I, I researched this guy for years. His name is uh, Michael Harris, Dr. Michael Harris, preeminent colorectal surgeon in the world, studied under Dr. Crone, got an appointment with him when they heard that I had high grade dysplasia, which was theoretically cancerous, becoming cancer, very highly cancerous or very highly precancerous. And um, I had to make a decision. Did I want to go all the way out to Inglewood, New Jersey and have that surgery with this preeminent surgeon who spent two hours with us to talk to us about it? Or did I want to have surgery close to home because it'd be easier for my family? It'd be easier, uh, you know, for uh, me to get around. People wouldn't have to travel so much. The, you know, the distance was crazy because Inglewood's close to New York. And driving home, two things happened. One, I'm talking to my wife and I said, um, I, I, I don't know what to do here. I said, I, I love this guy. I said, this guy, he said, call me Mickey. I mean, there's a guy, a preeminent surgeon in the world, call me Mickey instead of Dr. Harris. And I'm like, oh my God, you know, this is what, what a person he is just to be like that. And I'm like, I don't know what to do. And I, 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 I like slam my hands down and I turned to the side, I looked out the side and the truck next to me said, Harris, the trucking company was Harris. 10 minutes later, we get a call from my in-laws and they say uh, our daughter, our youngest daughter, Rebecca fell and banged her head and she's got to go to the uh, pediatrician. They, they, they don't know if she needs stitches or not. She hit her head on a, on a um, table. And we said, all right, great. Not great, but all right. Yeah. Take her to the pediatrician, you know, do whatever they need to do. You have our consent. They could do whatever they want. And we said, what doctor is she going to see? And they said, Dr. Harris. Now, what were the odds in that span of 10 minutes after visiting with Dr. Harris 
the preeminent colorectal surgeon to see the truck that had Harris on it. And for my daughter, I didn't, I'm not glad she got hurt, but for her to get hurt and be taken care of by a Dr. Harris, again, I mean, what are the odds of this? You know, I mean, it, it, so right then and there, the decision was made. I said, it's over. There's no decision. I said, the decision is made. It was made for me. I see we have a comment, so I'd like to take that, please. Rachel says, I believe one year after my mom died, she came to me in a dream on December 26th through the 27th. She said, I just wanted to say Merry Christmas. And when we hugged, and when she hugged me, I felt it when I woke up. Rachel has been a great friend of mine for a very long period of time. I've known Rachel um, since we were really kids. We were like in our teens and she's a wonderful person. And Rachel, I want to thank you for for write, writing in and, and sharing that with us. I, I believe that. I believe it was your mom. I really do. And I, I'm glad you had that experience. I'm glad that that happened to you because when it does, it's it's a special thing. It's it's something that's um, beyond belief so for some people. But I believe. I really do. Um, but you know, it, these these are things that that that. You know, a lot of people look at the, the one, the one big one that, that never didn't happen to me. It's not, not my, my story, but uh, some of you might remember Emmett Kelly, the famous sad clown and Emmett Kelly never, ever, ever, ever had a picture taken of him out of character. So Emmett Kelly always had the sad face. Every picture you see of Emmett Kelly has a sad face, except for one picture. He was at an airport and he got a call from his wife that his daughter was born and he was a father and he smiled a huge smile. And there was a photographer there and the photographer said, Oh my God, I got to get this picture of Emmett Kelly. It'll be the only picture of Emmett Kelly smiling. And he took the picture and became a famous picture. People, you can look it up. You just look it up on the internet. Anytime you want It's a famous picture. It's a, I don't even know. I might've won the Pulitzer prize. It was, it was that big of a deal that how could Emmett Kelly get caught out of character? And the photographer had no reason why he was smiling. He just saw him smiling. He didn't know what the reason was. But the reason was that he, he became a dad. So Emma Kelly's daughter was on a flight to go to his funeral, to, to see his body and then to go to his funeral. And she had a newspaper with her. And she's reading an article about her father. And there's the picture of Emmett Kelly smiling. And it said, this is the only photo that they've ever found of Emmett, Ken Emmett Kelly smiling. And they said, for reasons unknown. And she began to cry because she knew the reason. She knew the reason was because it was over her, because she was born. And, it, and because she was born, he was smiling. And now he was gone and she was having to say goodbye. So she's crying. The man next to her in the seat next to her said, what's wrong? Can, you know, can I help you? And she said, well, you know, I'm, I'm upset. My father died. And she and he said, oh, I'm sorry to hear that. And she said, yeah, my father was Emmett Kelly. And uh, uh, chills went through this guy and he, he, he almost passed out. And he said, you're not going to believe this. I'm the photographer who took the picture of your father smiling at that payphone. What are the chances of that? I mean, are, are there any odds of that? I mean, is, does that, is there any way to measure the odds that that would happen? It, it's just, it's, it's, it's impossible. So when people say it's a magic man or in heaven, or if it, it, it's, it's all, you know, just coincidences or it's smoke and mirrors and it's not, not if you believe it, it's really not. And it's not that far fetched. It's not that far fetched. If you believe now, there are going to be some people who are not going to believe and there's not much you can do about that. And that's a shame because those people are never going to feel the peace that you feel when you know that these signs are real and you know that these signs are there to comfort you. And I even believe that you could talk to people from your heart to their heart through a distance. When my uncle uh, in, in 2014 was going through a surgery. We were sitting there all night long and it looked like he was going to die. They said he's probably not going to make it through surgery. And I, for some reason, I happened to be sitting near the door and they said they needed some help pushing the gurney out. So I went out and I pushed the gurney and I stood there and he's out cold completely. And the doctors are around him. And I literally closed my eyes and I talked to his heart 
I mean, that sounds ridiculous. That sounds crazy. But I said, Uncle Bobby, you're not going to let go. You're going to fight this. I said, we're fighting with you. I said, we're all right here. I said, you got a whole warrior team on your side. He said, we're fighting right now. I said, you can hear me. Your heart can hear me. Pump. Keep fighting. Keep pumping. And I said, I know you can hear me. And I believed it at the time. And I still believe it today. And he pulled through. They passed away later, but he pulled through that surgery. But I've thought about friends. They may not have even known it, that I've made a connection with them heart to heart. They may have no idea. Maybe they felt something and didn't know what they felt. But I've, I've prayed so hard for friends and, and, and have been in such a state where I know that there is a connection made through distance, through time, years, you know, that somehow, some way they knew that I was thinking about them. Somehow, some way they knew that my heart reached out to theirs and they might not recognize it. They may never recognize it. But I believe those things happen. And I think it's important to recognize the signs that we're getting. You know, I, 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 I don't believe in all this. You know, uh, I don't believe in bad signs. I don't I don't believe in, in uh, you know, fire and brimstone. I don't believe in any of that. I think it's all good. I, I don't believe in 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 a, in a hell or a Satan. And I don't, I don't believe any of that. I, I believe that God made everything good. And yeah, we make bad decisions. We do bad things. We do things that are evil. But at the end of the day, God doesn't lose any of us, not a single one of us, none. And as, as ludicrous as this may sound, whether it's Hitler or bin Laden or, or Saddam Hussein or some of the worst people who ever lived on earth, I think they, they, understand what they've done when they get to heaven i think they they are that the god shows them the damage that they did and they're forced to feel it and and to to recognize it and to understand it but i don't think god loses any one of us because i can tell you right now i have two daughters and if they lit me on fire i would never stop loving them there's nothing that they can do for them to lose me it's impossible it just can't happen and if that's the way i feel then how could God feel any way different? So to wrap things up, I know we're up against the time. I just, you know, wanted to share those with you. And I'm glad, Rachel, thank you for sharing yours. I really do appreciate it. And um, just look for those signs. I mean, you're not going to get them every time. It's not magic. It's not going to be something that happens every day, but take it for what it is. And as we wrap it up, Talking about miracles, we're going to have a miracle. We're going to we're going to save people from inflammatory bowel disease. That's what put me in the position I'm in with an ostomy bag. So we're going to get people uh, away from that. We're going to save people from that and help people who are with an ostomy. August 23rd of next year, 2025, which will pretty soon be this year, uh, we're going to have the, uh, an NHL celebrity game. Another one. We've had several of them. But this one, some really big names. Mark Recchi. Brian Proud, Chris Terrian, Doug Crossman, uh, possibly Kevin Deneen, some big names in, in the NHL. Maybe Rod Brindamore, former flyer and coach of the uh, Hurricanes, might join us. Rolf Anershka is going to be there. He's He started a, a group for people with ostomy uh, called um, Embracing Ostomy Life. So we're going to run a little uh, uh, snippet of what that night's going to be like. And pretty soon we're going to put tickets on sale. And I say this every week, and I'm going to say it again. We, we fit 700 people in that restaurant. I want 700 hugs at the restaurant, and we fit 1,000 people at the rink. I want 1,000 hugs at the rink. So I need you to go there. I need you to go there. It's www.checkmatescharity.com. Pretty soon, tickets will go on sale. We're going to get them on sale before Christmas. They're only $70, the tickets. That's it. You meet all these celebrities. They're more than just hockey players. We have other celebrities coming. You get a, a full buffet, two-hour open bar. Uh, we could close the place. She said, even though the party's still 12, we could stay till 2 o'clock in the morning. Uh, we have all kinds of things going on. It's going to be an incredible party, an incredible night. So watch this little snippet, and this is just a little taste of what we're going to come up and have in August.
special evening. Uh, Crohn's and colitis are terrible diseases and they affect a lot of people, not only in the Delaware Valley, but all over the world. And uh, hopefully we can find a cure someday. Lunon here with you uh, at the Checkmates uh, versus the Flyers alumni. We had a great time this afternoon. Uh, game was close, and uh, we're all here for Checkmates Charities, which is the, the real reason that, that everybody's here, not only the players, but all the fans that were here. It was a great day, and we're really happy to be here. It was fun to be out here uh, at Northeast Skate Zone because uh, the Chuckos were a pretty good team and uh, so we had a lot of fun with uh, the charity. And it was good because they took it easy on us old guys. So uh, well, we had a good time. So any, anytime you can do something for charity and uh, no couple guys on the other team and just to be on the rink, we all go have fun. Good times go. I'm either go. I want to thank uh, my family for all that they did to help me get through this and there's a lot of planning that gets to get done, that has to get done. I want to thank Nick's Roast Beef and Cotman Avenue for all they've done. Dr. Prieto for saving my life uh, and finding the uh, disease and, and treating me for so long. And uh, the Flyers organization for all they do to help us uh, raise money every year. So thank you everybody, I appreciate that. Now, if that doesn't get you pumped, what will? And you'd be coming out for a good cause. All those great hockey players and celebrities. Lauren Hart's going to be there. Uh, Lou Nolan, Ralph Benershka. Just an amazing night. So please come out for that. And I think we have another comment, actually. So I want to go ahead and uh, take that. What about God sending us back to earth to repent? Um, I mean, I... I I don't believe that happens. I don't I don't think we come back to earth. That doesn't mean that I'm right. I think the way I see it, Rachel, is that we're all in heaven, but you don't just get a free pass if you've been a horrible person. And I mean, I'm talking about really a horrible person. We all make mistakes. We're all sinners, right? We all we all do things that we shouldn't do. But the way I see it is when 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 we get to heaven and we're before God and Jesus is standing next to us, what is going to happen is we're going to be saying, but I did this and I did that. And Jesus is going to say, but yeah, but what about when you did this good thing? What about when you did this good thing? What about when you did this? What about when you helped this person? What do you... So I think he's going to really be there to, to kind of say, you know, yeah, all right, you made mistakes. But what's more important is the good stuff that you did, the stuff that you did to make people's lives better, the stuff that you did to be good. So is it possible that, that God could bring us back to earth to repent? Sure. I mean, it's possible, but I really believe that 
even somebody as bad as bin Laden, and it, it, it's hard for me to say that because as a human being, if I could choke bin Laden myself, I would. I'd be honest with you. I mean, after what I saw on 9-11, if he was alive and was standing in front of me with my own bare hands, I would, I would want to go after him. It's hard for me to, I can't forgive him, but I'm not God. I don't have that ability to forgive. I don't have that divine forgiveness. So I don't think that bin Laden just goes right through the, the gate to heaven and, and he's there and that's it. You know, congratulations, you made it. I think he's got to figure out, he's got to feel what it felt like. He's got to understand what he did. He's got to apologize to all the people he hurt, thousands and thousands and thousands of people, 3,000 who died, the families who, who lost loved ones. He's got to be repenting for a long, long time, but I don't think God loses him. I think eventually even his horrible human heart would be softened to the point where he'll go to heaven. But your question about could we come back to earth? I don't know. You know, I really, I, I, like I said, I don't think we have any experts in these areas. I think we just have what we believe and that's, and, and that's it. And, you know, some of us will be right. Some of us will have, I'll tell you this. We all have some of it right. And we all have some of it wrong. Is that fair? I think we all have parts of the story, right? I just don't think we have all of the story, right? And I don't think anybody can. You know, we don't know exactly everything. And we'll find out one day. But with all the signs that I've been through and all the signs that I've seen and all those, not just dreams, but, but moments that have happened, you can't tell me that this is all coincidence. Because if it was coincidence, the, the, the odds of these things, would, the, the, you wouldn't even be able to, to put odds together. They would be so astronomical that it would be like, you know, think about this. There have been on Earth 117 billion people that have walked the face of the Earth. 117 billion have walked the face of the Earth. You're one. Uh, you're the one of 117 billion. You yourself are a miracle. You're the only one who is you out of 117 billion. You're a miracle. What are the odds? One in 117 billion. You are the one in 117 billion. So I want to thank you for allowing me to share this with you in this show. Uh, there's my website for my business. Uh, I do computer training. I train people on uh, the Microsoft applications. I also train people uh, on uh, soft skills like time management, uh, conflict management. I do one-on-one -on -one training individuals. Uh, I do corporate training, obviously. Uh, lunch and learns. I do mostly remotely now. Uh, in this day and age, we could do it remotely uh, almost with any company. And it, I'm looking for partners uh, for the charity. And part of the uh, packages that I'm giving away are going to be free classes. Now, the, I charge $2,000 a day for a class. And I'm going to give away two classes to uh, people who partner with us to have their, for their partnership. They're going to get tickets. They're going to get two classes. That's $4,000 right there. They're going to get their uh, logo on the jersey. They're going to um, uh, have all kinds of perks. They'll be uh, uh, thanked on the show weekly. I mean, just tons and tons of things I have for you. Uh, what we want to do is give a return on investment of four to ten times what you, let's not call it donate, partner with. So we have packages that are already pre-built and we can customize packages as well. So any companies out there that are interested in something like that, where you can get a lot of exposure, you can get to meet a lot of celebrities, you can have free classes that would cost you thousands of dollars and tickets to the event. It's a no brainer. You got it. You got to join us. So hopefully we'll have some people come in and, and be a part of it. So thanks. I want to thank Dr. Jacqueline for, um, producing the show tonight. I want to thank uh, Rachel for calling in or uh, uh, typing in. I really appreciate that, Rachel. And I uh, hope more people do that as the weeks go on. And, and um, just want to thank you for your time. And we'll have another show next week. And uh, until then, have a great rest of your week. And I'll see you next Monday. We face daily cyber risks, spending over seven hours of screen time 
including 4.5 hours on mobile phones. This convenience comes with significant dangers, with cybercrime costs predicted to exceed $10.5 trillion by 2025. In 2023 alone, seniors lost over $3.4 billion to cybercrime. Our goal is to make social engineering concepts of cybersecurity easier to understand. We work with business teams, senior living facilities, investment companies, and educational institutions, both individually and in groups. We offer real-life examples to help you recognize and prevent attacks, with sessions available both in person, in selected regions, and remotely. Schedule your training session, or to learn more, contact us today. Call us at 847-845-9360. Email us at info at cybersecurityeasy.com. Protect your team and family with cybersecurityeasy.com. My name is Dr. Felix Kravitz, and I am the founder of cybersecurityeasy.com, LLC. We live in a world full of vulnerabilities and cyber risks. We spend almost four and a half hours a day on our mobile phones. It's over seven hours of screen time daily when including computer use. We often forget that this convenience comes with risks. Published data predicts that the cost of cybercrime will exceed $10.5 trillion in 2025. These numbers encompass not only businesses, but also each one of us, including our children and our parents. In 2023, the FBI reported over $3.4 billion lost by seniors aged 60 and older. CybersecurityEasy.com LLC's initiative is to massively support the community by providing cyber safety coaching and improving social engineering awareness. Our goal is to make social engineering concepts of cybersecurity easier to understand. We work with business teams, seniors, and educational institutions, both individually and in groups. We cover various topics from phone phishing attacks to AI generated voice cloning robocalls, password protection, and more using life examples. Talk to us today. Call us at 847-845-9360 or email us at infozucybersecurityeasy.com.